I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die No one really knows why gravity exists Naming something doesn't mean that we get it So I'll live each day with wonder We're here to learn about bees. And first, I've got to tell you a little bit about Wonderfest. Wonderfest is the barrier beacon of science. Um, Wonderfest believes that science insight is important for every individual and for society as a whole. We produce public science events about, um, how, about reality and, and a a society that doesn't face reality is a society headed for trouble. So if you find that these values are important to you, please consider joining Wonderfest, which for us means becoming a patron. You could also make a little donation there at the box that is guarded by my lovely wife, Darlene. Um, there's a little box there that says, please give what this event is worth to you, what value you think this event has. But if you'd like to become a regular member or patron of Wonderfest, please visit wonderfest.org and go to our donations page and see about uh, becoming a regular patron. Thank you. You can do it for $1 a month. That's great support, and we much appreciate it. All right. It is my pleasure to introduce Noah Wilson Rich. He's a behavioral ecologist, a beekeeper, and the founder of the Best Bees Company. This company has clients all over, the, all over the country, including here in San Francisco. Noah earned his bachelor's degree in biology at Northeastern University in 2005. He graduated from the Bee School of Ex Essex County, Massachusetts. We got to ask him about that, the Bee School, in 2007. And in 2011, he earned his PhD in biology from Tufts University. As an academic scientist, Noah has published over a dozen papers on disease resistance in social animals, although I think not us. And he is currently researching the efficacy of three different vaccines for honeybees, patents pending, and with very tiny syringes. <laughs> Noah has given two TED Talks and is the author of the new book, the Bee, a natural history that you can check out over here at our entry table. Please join me in welcoming all the way from Boston, Noah Wilson Rich. Hello, I'm Noah. Nice to meet you all tonight. Thank you so much for coming. What a great group. This is awesome. So, um, so I'd like to start off tonight by taking a page out of the book of the moth, which is not the bee, but we'll do a little back and forth here tonight. The moth, it's an NPR thing. It's also just a storytelling thing, and really that's all I'm doing with you tonight, telling a story. So um, for any of you who listen to the moth, maybe you'll know it's about storytelling, and the rule there is no learning, no teaching, it's just talking, right? I like that because it gets my mind off of all the data sometimes. So tonight I'm going to do a little bit of storytelling, but first we're going to learn a little bit. I hope that's okay. So I'm going to get the data out of the way first. And what I'm going to show you right now in this boring, ugly Excel chart, <laughs> this is hot off the presses. And don't worry if you're not able to see this, because I'll explain it to you. It's only three bars. It's a bar chart, right? This has never before been presented. You are the first people to see these data. <gasps> so let the wonder begin, right? What we're looking at here relates to honey production. So bees, honey, right? We get it. We're easing in to the data here. We're looking on the x-axis, so looking across that flat line, the horizontal, at land use or habitat type, compared across urban, suburban, and rural habitats. And this is really looking at New England, so the greater Boston area, because 
you know, you gotta start somewhere, and I just need more time in the day to keep analyzing our other metro areas, including the Bay Area. But what we see here on the y-axis, on the vertical, is honey production. And this is a trend we have been seeing for years. I first presented this in my 2012 TED Talk, and even for 2014, this past year, these are what we're seeing. The very first bar on the left shows urban honey production, it's much higher than the middle bar, which is suburban honey production. And then the bar closest to me is rural honey production. And these are statistically significant differences between habitats using basic t-tests and ANOVAs. We'll have to do some more fancy stats to keep hashing out these data, but these are new, hot off the presses. And it's also something that might not be that interesting to urban beekeepers because many of us already understand that bees in the cities are more productive than bees in the countryside. They're also surviving the winters better than bees in the countryside. It's really weird, right? But it's also what we've been seeing for every year, for at least the past six years, when the Best Bees Company, that's my beekeeping operation, that, that's what we've been seeing. So to us, okay, we get it. These data now help explain it. So we're doing a longitudinal study, and I'll keep you updated with that. But it's kind of fun to start off with the data, and then we'll explore it. Maybe I'll put this out to you first, though, to continue on the wonder. Why is this? That's the million dollar question. Maybe throw out some of your ideas to me. Why do bees in the city do better than bees in the country? It's the urban buzz. It's diversity of food. <laughs> the urban buzz. Diversity of food. That is a huge one. And there's actually an article right now, today, in the UK Daily Mail that has another report about the diversity of bee species looking at rural environments compared to urban environments. There are more species of bees in the cities than there are in the countryside. And this was across four cities in England. So that's just another metric for why bees are doing better in the cities. But we still don't know why, right? Diversity of food seems to be a huge one. So a leading hypothesis. What other ideas do you have? Predators, I heard here, right? So predators of bees, we think bears. That's one. It's true. We don't have as many bears here. Less pesticides, it's a huge one, a leading hypothesis as well. So perhaps in the cities, we don't have these pesticides that are sprayed in the agricultural chemicals beyond pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, just chemical use in general, perhaps could be less in the cities. What else? Distance to food. So even with the diverse food, perhaps it's closer than the monoculture crops that are just spread out. It's nice to eat pizza every day. I like pizza, but after a few days, I'd start to feel pretty ill, you know? Having a buffet is a better thing. So it's fun to think about these things, and until we can really figure out why, these are just leading hypotheses, as we'd call them. All right, we'll continue on with the learning section of the talk, and then we'll get into the fun stuff, the crazy stuff. Bees are a female-dominated society. It's really fun to think about, especially when I'm teaching my classes. I teach at one school in the Boston area called Simmons College. It's an all-women's college, and I teach animal behavior there. It's so fun to talk about this. Female-dominated societies to a female-dominated audience. It's cool. In this image here, we have some spilled honey. Right? Nobody's crying about spilled honey, so to speak, because these bees, these girls, are the ones that will just collect it right back up and bring it back to the hive. The boys don't do much. And it was a chapter in my dissertation, thinking, what do bees do? What do the males do? And I'll just cut to the chase, and it was inconclusive. It, <laughs> it really was. I spent years in graduate school figuring out the immune function of bees, because we know that the worker bees, they're all female. In terms of honeybees, as we're talking about for right now, they're tens of thousands of worker bees, they're all female. They are the ones who go out to flowers. If you see a honeybee foraging on a flower, it's a female. Say, look at her. Boys don't do that. The drones, that's what the males are called. Boys don't even have stingers. If you get stung by a bee, it was a female. You could say, that little you know, female just stung me. Because the boys don't even do that. 
What's more is that the males, the drones, get sick. They get infections more so than females do. So there's the dreaded varroa mite, which is this awful pest that's infected our honeybee hives in America starting in 1987. And we know that the males, the drones, get more infections, more of these pests of the varroa mites than the females do. And we still don't really understand why. So female-dominated society, girl power, they're just better. In order to really understand bees, we have to really see how bees see the world. And this is where I hope to inspire you. And I really hope for you guys to maybe, maybe even take the day tomorrow and try to see the world through the eyes of bees. In order for us to understand bees, we need to figure out how they see the world. We see a very hot world. So this flower on the right, it's yellow, if you can't see. It's a yellow flower. The world to humans is very hot. We see reds and oranges and yellows much more than bees do. The world to bees is very cool. So that same flower might look how it does on the left here, like blue, maybe even with a very dark blue center. You think about how flowers and these angiosperms, the flowering plants, have co-evolved with bees and po pollinators so that the color pattern can even draw the bee into the center to collect the nectar and to transfer pollen, which is pollination. Pollination is just flower sex via bees. You know, it's kind of this third party intermediate. The secret sex lives of flowers are very interesting, but that's perhaps for another talk. If we want to expand this view, you kind of understand how we see a very hot world, but bees don't even see the color red. Bees do not see red. Bees do see ultraviolet, which we do not see. It's very interesting. So there was one paper that came out just last year that had a whole array of flowers at the top row here. And again, for those of you who might not be able to see these, they're just different colored flowers. That's how we see flowers, the top row. The middle row is those same flowers, but in a different coloration. They're false color images, but based on how we believe bees see those same flowers. It's totally different. And that bottom row has an overlay of this hexagonal pattern on top of the color that we think bees can see, because their eyes are different. And I'll start with another quiz here, too. How many eyes does a bee have? Four? It's very close. It's very close. How many eyes does a bee have? Any other guesses? Three. Close. Six. Five. Five. I was like, oh, we're dancing around the number five tonight. <laughs> That's great. Bees have five eyes. I don't know. I didn't do it, right? It's very, it's very weird, but it's different, and it's important for us to understand this because if we're going to understand anything about bees, we need to understand how they see the world. So they have five eyes, right? They have two compound eyes, so similar to our eyes, and they perceive different things, and they can see color and all of these other things that bring them information. And then they have three simple eyes. And those three simple eyes of these ocelli are things that can perceive lightness and darkness. So with that combination of five eyes, they're able to then perceive all of this information. And they tend to navigate by landmarks. So they'll take a right at your house and then take a left you know, down Folsom, and then they're at their little beehive type thing. You know, It's pretty amazing. <laughs> Continuing on with our learning portion of the evening, let's get back to the males. Now, they have no fathers. And perhaps this can explain some of the weird things about male bees. But female bees do have fathers. And this gets down to the genetics of bees. So they're haplodiploid organisms. And I'm not going to go too much into the genetics of it all. But to compare that to us humans, we're diploid, so to speak. So we have two sets of chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, right? Equal contributions from both. But with bees, they're haplodiploid. So that means that males, they only have one set of chromosomes. Because they have no fathers, they arise from unfertilized eggs. A queen bee will lay an egg, and if it's unfertilized, it's a male. If she fertilizes that egg, it then has two sets of chromosomes, and it's a female. That's sex determination in bees. It's pretty weird. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's where we'll leave it at tonight. To add to the wonder of this, even though males have no fathers, they do have grandfathers. What? Right? And it's because the queen has a father. 
And I'm going to leave it at that. They only have one grandfather, the queen's father. All right, enough of the who's the baby daddy beefing. <laughs> Let's move it on to the vegan diet of bees. Now, many of you, I'm sure, have some type of fear of bees, even if you don't want to admit it. Maybe some of you do. But if you did have a huge fear of bees, you probably wouldn't come tonight because you think this is all too crazy altogether. And I get that. I really do. But it's important to acknowledge what bees are and what they aren't. So bees are vegan garden pollinators, as I tend to say. Yeah, go vegan, right? And this started a long, long time ago, about 100 million years ago. That's when we saw the first bees. And it matches well with when we saw, well, not we, we weren't here as humans, but when the first flowering plants came to be. Now, they started off as wasps. So 100 million years ago, when the first flowers or proto-flowers came to be, that's when some of these carnivorous wasps were thinking, oh, wow, here's a new food source. Let's go visit these. And they just kind of ran off together. So bees are this kind of cousin-like offshoot of wasps. And it's important to not confuse the two, because 100 million years later, we're still doing this. We still think that bees are wasps, and bees get a very bad rap because of this misconception. Wasps can keep stinging and stinging and stinging. They do not have a barbed stinger like many bees do, like honeybees do. So a honeybee does have a stinger, but it dies when it stings. And she dies when she stings. Remember that lesson, the boys don't sting. I call wasps steak knives with wings, right? <laughs> They're aggressive. They're meat eaters. It's part of their nature. So it's important to understand that yellow jackets, hornets, paper wasps, these things are not honeybees. And I used this little meme that went around on Facebook a few years ago. I started this book tour in Los Angeles last June at the Museum of Natural History. And um, there were some kids in the audience. And everybody's grown up here. But there's a swear word. So I'm about to cuss because I get passionate about this, OK? So this is what a bee is and what a wasp is, OK? And a bee says they pollinate flowers. They make honey. They improve the environment. And they're reluctant to sting. Under the wasp, it's just one line, just an asshole. <laughs> Forgive me for swearing, but it's important to have this discussion. What is a bee and what is it not? OK, we need our pollinators. Now, in terms of the evolution of bees, I mentioned that bees have been around for a very long time. And there are so many different species of bees. Honeybees get all of the credit. We're going to talk about this a little bit tonight. They're kind of the teacher's pet of the pollinator world. We say, oh, thanks, honeybees, for all the fruits and vegetables on our plates today. And then the other 20,000 species of bees say, what about us? Right? So that's kind of a problem that I'm hoping that each of you will leave here tonight really understanding. What's really neat about bees is that there are some aspects that don't have anything to do with genetics, as we've gone into, but just the environment. For example, what makes a queen bee live for years compared to all of her sister worker bees or her daughter worker bees, given the hive, and they only live for about a month? What, what is that difference? Yeah. That's what she does in the world. Other walk bees just walk themselves to death. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, this is good. So a huge difference between the queen bee of a honeybee hive, of which there is only one queen per hive, and the workers, of which there are tens of thousands, is there's a big behavioral difference here. So the worker bees are going out to the flowers, and they're pollinating, and it's hard work, and their wings get frayed, and they die really out in the field of exhaustion. and that wear and tear on their bodies. The queen, many think that it, she just stays home and she doesn't have this wear and tear, and so that she can then live for years. She's actually more of like an egg-laying slave in a way. I mean, she lays about a 1,000 eggs a day for years. <laughs> What's even more remarkable here is that there's no genetic difference between the queen bee and the worker bees. It's only an environmental difference based on the food that the queen bee was fed when she was an, a larva. 
they're all fed royal jelly. It's a very protein-rich substance. Sometimes you go to Whole Foods and you have to pay an arm and a leg to get some because it's this fountain of youth. Maybe you'll live for 500 years. Maybe not. <laughs> the queen bee is fed this for about a week longer than the worker bees. And just that additional protein when she's developing as a larva allows her to develop her reproductive organs fully. And she's able to mate. Worker bees are functionally sterile and not able to mate. And she's able to live for three to five years instead of one month. So bees are a really amazing example of evolution and Darwinian evolution, thinking about nature versus nurture. Or is it really more one or the other? It's a fun case study. Today, we're going to take a bit of a field trip around the world. And we're going to understand these other 20,000 or so species of bees, looking at the domino cuckoo bee in Australia. And then what is not in Australia? Bumblebees. Bumblebees are not native to Australia, and if you see a bumblebee, it's a problem. It's a big deal. As they're spreading around the world, we're learning more and more about different bees and the different diseases that they can transmit, and there is so much more to learn. Inevitably, they're also dying now. And it's a bit of a depressing topic, and it's a hard topic to go around and talk about bee deaths, right? I used to tap dance a little bit when I would talk about this to try to cheer people up, like bees are dying, but let's be cheerful about it. It is a severe problem. And in the United States alone, our average loss of honeybee hives every year is about one out of three hives. They don't make it through the winter time or a drought period. And it's a problem. And it's unsustainable. And we still don't exactly know why. Now, many people talk about colony collapse disorder as what's killing our bees. Maybe some of you have heard of this. It's this weird phenomenon that started in 2006, really in the apple fields in Pennsylvania, is where we first took note of this mysterious vanishing of bees. It wasn't just that bees were dying, but it was that they were disappearing. They were gone. There were no dead bodies. It was, it was like CSIB. Like, <laughs> where did they go? And it's really hard to diagnose how does something die if you don't have the body. So this all led for the sudden disappearance and deaths of bees to become so much more than just a scientific issue. It was a mainstream issue. And it got people talking about where does our food come from, and what's a pollinator, and what's killing bees, and how can we save them? It seems as though colony collapse disorder has ended. And this is controversial. It seems maybe it stopped around 2011. So in September, I published an article in the New York Times announcing this because scientists already knew it. And I would go to conferences, and researchers in academia and in the government would say, we haven't seen a confirmed case of CCD in three years now. And I would say, does anybody know this? Is somebody going to tell anybody? Anybody talking about this? And I think the reason why scientists did not tell people is because we didn't know how to frame the discussion. We didn't want to say, oh, CCD's over. Now everything's OK. What's changed is that now we find the dead bodies. So bees are still dying. It's just that when we open the beehives, it's a pile of dead bees instead of no bees. And that's really important because we need to keep the momentum going. We need for more covers like this on Time Magazine last year to stay in the front of everybody's minds. So we're doing that tonight. I want to tell you a little bit about who's this guy, right? So that's me. And, uh, and so what I do is I do research on how to improve bee health. And I have got a great team. We're based in Boston. We've got what's called the Urban Beekeeping Laboratory. Many students. We've got postdocs. We are entirely funded by beekeeping. I started this company while I was in grad school. I had no money. I had an idea on how to make bees healthier based on my research on how their immune function worked. But I would also be staring. Every night, I would stare at this pile of unfunded grants. I would look at these grant applications, and it would make me depressed. And my, grad, my PhD advisor would do the same thing. My PhD advisor has never had a grant. I have never had a grant. But we couldn't let that stop us. So one day I said, I have to think outside the box. How are we going to get this funding? And so I started a Facebook page. And I said, hey, selling beehives, volunteering my time to manage them, raising funding for honeybee research. And it was a crazy idea. And I've never taken a business class before. And I had no money. But 
somebody messaged me and wanted to buy a beehive. And I said, oh my gosh, what do I do now, right? <laughs> so I hopped on a city bus, and I went to his house, and he was like, great, I want a hive. You know, here's a, a deposit. And then with that, I went to buy a hive and <laughs> delivered it to him, and then he made a donation, and that was sale number one. And this year, we're up to 700 hives, and our team of about 20 beekeepers. Thank you. And we have our first national client. So this is with a Beacon Capital Partners. They are a corporate real estate giant. They own most of the lead certified green office space in the country. They kind of flip skyscrapers in a way. Have you ever seen like flip this house? Well, this is like, it's like skyscraper version. So they update them to be green buildings and lead certified green and they're putting beehives at all of them. And this is how we were able to come to San Francisco and Seattle, Chicago, Denver, DC, New York, Boston, even LA where We'll get to the problems there. For the problem in LA, by the way, it's because it's illegal. We'll get to that. Now, this is a great opportunity because we hire local beekeepers. So paying jobs for beekeepers, it's all a really good thing. And you know, this is something that Science Magazine picked up in their career section for how to get research funded in a tough grant environment. So that's a little bit of our story. I want to now show how we also help cities. Urban beekeeping, as we know now very well, is a good thing for the bees. It's not just this fad, right? It's not just something like, oh, I'm a hip, hipster urban beekeeper, right? It's something that has longevity to it because it's where bees are doing better. But many people think that, okay, if we get beekeeping in a city, we're going to have things like this. This is a swarm of honeybees. And this was in Boston. This happened right before Red Sox game. And every year, my friends take me to the Sox for my birthday. It's just an easy thing to do. And I was like, I don't have time for this. It's one of these things that never happens at a convenient moment, you know, when like, the mayor's office calls up at our lab, or animal control, or the cops, and they're like, we got a swarm, you need to get out there now. So we did this. Swarms are a reproductive process. So basically, if you think about a beehive as a super organism, this is a term that E.O. Wilson and his colleagues at Harvard have worked out, it's one animal, but it's made up of many different individuals. If you think about the workers as blood cells, let's say, and the queen as ovaries, and there are even some guard bees, like the teenagers, and they hang out on the front stoop, and they only let their relatives come in, you know, <laughs> unless you have food. If there's an unrelated bee with pollen or nectar and wants to come in, then they say, okay, you can come in. When that hive gets ready to have a baby, it has a swarm, so to speak. And this is what it looks like. Now, swarms tend to involve about half of the bees in the hive, so tens of thousands of bees. And the old queen that leaves, it's very different from humans, right? Can you imagine raising kids, and then when your kids come of age, you have to move out, right? <laughs> It's one of the ways that bees are unlike humans, but these swarms leave before they have a place to go. And if you've ever had a friend who just packed up and moved to New York City, let's say, without a job or a home, and you're thinking, wow, good for you. That takes a lot of courage. You know, that's kind of like what this is. These swarms don't have a place to live yet. They just go, and it takes about two to three days for them to figure out where to move to, but they often land on an inconvenient place, like this car. So when I got to this swarm, Everybody was there. We had the media. We had the cops. We had all the townspeople, as I was saying. The groups of kids were daring one another, go run up and see if you can touch it, and then run back. You know, who's the bravest one? These are not aggressive at all. Granted, they're startling. It's a bit strange. But they have eaten so much food already, they gorge themselves on honey because they don't know when they're gonna get their next meal. So it's like after Thanksgiving dinner, they're like, oh, don't touch me. <laughs> it's, it's very much like that. So what the beekeeper does is you just have a brush, the, we call it a bee brush, but you can just use a paint brush or even if you ever get snow, you can get a snow scraper thing. And you just brush the bees into a box and that's it and they fall right in. They're like, uh. It's quite easy to do, but the cops, that was a different story. <laughs> They, they pulled me aside, and I was like, oh, I'm in so much trouble now. I don't even know what I did, but I'm in trouble. They said, uh, is there a decomp in the car? And I said, what's a decomp? And they said, a decomposing body. <laughs> and, and I said, 
I don't think that bees are any more attracted to a decomposing body than we are. It's, it's, again, it's like the CSI bee thing. Like, I don't. I think they think this is a flower. You know, for the for those of you who can see the picture, it's a bright yellow car. So there was a very dramatic moment where we opened up the trunk after I got the bees off, and we didn't know what we would find. And it was a folded down baby carriage. It's like the most anticlimactic thing we could find. It was such a safe scene. So. So urban beekeepers are an asset to municipalities. We're able to then collect the swarms. Bees that live in their natural habitat live in crevices. They live in holes in trees. Think of Winnie the Pooh. You know, these are aerial creatures. It's actually something that makes them pre-adapted, in a sense, to living on rooftops. These are things that beekeepers can then help out with. So here's an image of our bee sanctuary. It's a fancy name for the parking lot of our lab. <laughs> Now, I started the laboratory in my living room in Boston, um, and I realized quickly that we couldn't get uh, chemical distribution companies to deliver lab supplies to a residential address. <laughs> Even though it was just ethanol, it was like, we can get vodka around the corner. You know, it's just, <laughs> it didn't work out. So now we have uh, an actual laboratory in a basement of a, an urban warehouse below an auto body shop. And a benefit to this, and again, if you're ever in Boston, you're welcome to visit, a benefit to this is their parking lot. They have these hydraulic car lifts that we have our beehives on now. And we call this the bee sanctuary because for whatever reason, reasons we don't understand fully, bees seem to do better here than anywhere else. And if there's a sick hive somewhere, we can actually swap it out for a healthy one and bring the sick hive here, and they just get better on their own. For the most part, I'm not saying there's this total magic to it, but it's great. And we can work out our experimental vaccines in this bee sanctuary, you know, otherwise graffiti strewn parking lot. And it's a lot of fun. I'll also show you with uh, some of our rooftop clients, like the Intercontinental Hotel here. They've worked with some of our artists. We have two full-time artists on staff. The rest of my team was a bit hesitant. Oh, we're scientists. Why not? We don't need artists here. And now that we have them, it's like, how did we ever survive without it? Like, every company needs full-time artists on staff. Like, just trust me. When they're there, like... <laughs> You're thinking, oh my gosh, how did we ever not do this? So you can see some of the hives from the Intercontinental Hotel in Boston. They're beautiful, beautifully designed. Their restaurant in the hotel is called Miel, the French word for honey. And there's a camera in front of one of the hives that projects an image of what the bees are doing to all the guests at the restaurant. I mean, it's cool, right? It's innovative. We've even worked with residential clients to make this kind of floating beehive appearance. So this is well above Ahab the dog so he doesn't have to get too curious and get stung. So you can incorporate urban beekeeping into our current fabric very easily. And I hope that this inspires a little bit of wonder in you tonight. This is Kelly Allen here. So she's currently our LA beekeeper. Shh. Again, it's illegal. And, uh, and we'll get into that. But as a student, she's the, a co-author on this book. So this book I'm very proud of in part because it's the first time I've published with a student of my own. So it's been a great opportunity to give back. The future, thank you, <laughs> the future for, for urban beekeeping and for us at the Best Bees Company, it's bright and it's good and it's encouraging and it's happening here in San Francisco, which is the most permissive city in the country for beekeeping. So thank you. You are a model for other cities, and that's a wonderful thing. The future for bees, though, remains in question, and so this is a really important thing that we need to talk about. In the times of colony collapse disorder, there were up to 100% of hives that were dying per apiary. And these were associated with these migratory beekeeping operations primarily. So for those of you who are associated at all with the almond growers, you know that honeybees are the only pollinator of almonds. There are other bees that can be trained to pollinate almonds, and I'll show you how, but these are really tightly connected, honeybees and migratory honeybees and almonds. It's monoculture crops. It's something that is a problem. So let me step you through this here. We've got, in the south, Louisiana, Georgia, places without a harsh winter where honeybees tend to overwinter, and then you have these bees that live on flatbed trucks. And there are more honeybees that live on flatbed trucks these days in the United States than do not. 
So more bees live on the highway than live in trees and in hives. This is the state of current US agricultural practices. It's estimated at about one and a half to two million honeybee hives live on trucks, and about one to 1.5 million do not. So that scale has tipped into bees living on highways. And they tend to go to the almonds to start off the year. So around mid-February to mid-March, they're pollinating the almonds. When those almond blooms fall off, there's no more food for the honeybees to forage upon, and they have to hit the road. So they'll go back to the south, unless there's something else in bloom at that time. They'll wait for winter to break. So they'll come up north, and they go to the apples in Pennsylvania. And they'll go to the cranberries in Massachusetts, and the blueberries in Maine, and the oranges in Florida, and so forth. Because all of these places only have one thing in bloom, these monoculture crops. It's a problem, and it's a problem for water, as we all know very well. And the solution could even just be in planting wildflowers, planting some more forage, even on the lines of the property or underneath the, the trees, so that bees can remain in permanent situations. They have food to forage upon. And those other flowering plants could perhaps help with water retention as well. So there are areas to improve. We're just not there yet. Again, the statistic for bees these days, 30 to 40% of bees do not survive each year in the United States. These were some data that I showed earlier in 2012. This initial trend that we were observing between overwinter survival, it was about one out of every three hives in the city would not make it through the winter, and it was about two out of every five bees in the country, beehives, would survive. So the survival and the honey yield are something that we have seen as a trend continue for years. This is perhaps my favorite slide that I like to show all the time. We see cities, especially New York City on the left, the rooftops, they are underutilized to the extreme. It's tar paper. What are we doing right now with this? It's inevitable that this is going to change. And in places like the Bay Area, you are progressive, similar to Europe, where you think, oh, OK, we're already thinking about green roofs. How do we use this space? In the future, the human population is growing exponentially even beyond that. But our land is not growing. We have to be smarter about how we're using that space. So I always like to keep that in mind. I want you to think about how your everyday lives are affected by bees before we get into the crazy part of the talk. This is the basics. Think about your lunch plate, perhaps on the left, or your breakfast plate with bees. You have fruits and vegetables, colorful, nutritious foods. In a world without bees, we won't run out of food. It'll just be very brown and very carby. Right? Very carbohydrate rich. It's not exactly the food trends these days. So this has affected policy. And we have the first beekeeper in the White House these days. You can even see the little beehive at the bottom left of that picture. Right? We've got bees at the White House. We have corporations that are taking note of how to improve their corporate sustainability records by being a model for other citizens and other corporations by thinking, oh, if I just get rooftop beehives at NPR or National Geographic, then maybe other companies will take note. And we're seeing this more and more frequently. And this is actually the target these days of my company. I look at corporations, the big ones, and I say, Who's your sustainability officer? If you have one, let's talk about how to roll out a beekeeping program so that you can be this model that other people will take note of. And it's working so far. Even Fenway Park wants to get bees next week, which is really awesome. Maybe we'll have that here. France is where this all started, OK? In Paris, the government of France has financial incentives for beekeepers. They encourage people to get bees. It's an amazing model. And I want you to think about how to contrast that with some other less amazing models. We can start in California with Palm Springs. So thinking about in France how you have a financial incentive to get bees. And uh, what's the cost of a permit for a beehive in Palm Springs? $500. 500 Keep going. $1,000. $1,000 per beehive, right? So it's allowed, because <laughs> that's the bright side. If you think about Kenya, their government has an amazing program. And I had the wonderful opportunity to go to Kenya with a group called Bees Without Borders, <laughs> which 
some people like, some people are highly offended by, and I understand both. I didn't name it, but it was wonderful. It was a great experience. We got to go there and work with the Samburu tribe, and it's about a 10-hour drive north of Nairobi. And so there's a person in the tribe whose sole job it is to sit with the bees 24 hours a day to guard them because these pollinators are so important to their livelihood for all of their crops. And we helped dig trenches to put fences in and then we poured cement in the fences because of this vicious honey badger, this awful little weasel. Yeah, it's a real thing. <laughs> we worked with the local tribes. We also worked with the government there. They have a wonderful center in Nairobi to train Kenyans on how to build beehives and how to become beekeepers. It's fantastic, so educational opportunities. You compare that with other places, like in Miami there was an instance of the government taking a beekeeper to court, Georgia's been having problems, even Cambridge, Massachusetts, they just forced a school in Cambridge to remove their beehives that were being used for education um, because there was no law saying you could do it and nothing saying you couldn't. And often municipalities will say, well, just get rid of it because people have questions. <laughs> it's a problem, right? And it doesn't have to be that way. Our last comparison here on our trip around the world in Australia, I love to compliment Australia. They have pooled their resources with the universities. Knowing that grants are hard to come by, whatever little grants people get, they have a consortium. And it's amazing because it helps even a little bit of research happen. It's really innovative. Compare that here now to Los Angeles. Right, the largest city with illegal beekeeping in the country where the policy is actually to kill bees upon sight. You have to kill beehives if you find them. And it's crazy because bees are doing so well in Los Angeles. <laughs> like so well. There's an estimate of nine to 11 feral beehives just kind of living in crevices you know, per city block. Like it's, you can't even keep them down. Everywhere else in the country, we can't keep them alive. So it's really crazy. And so we have uh, clients in LA and we have beehives and it's illegal and we're doing it anyway. It's a problem. <laughs> Yay, breaking the law. I want to frame this, though, with a compliment as well to the policymakers in Los Angeles because they're working hard to change this. They're working hard to legalize beekeeping. This was, beekeeping in LA, when do you think this was made illegal? 1989? Killer bees, right? Many people would think, okay, from those, the, the Hollywood movies, right, with the, the killer bees coming up. That started in the 1950s and kind of came up north, these aggressive bees from Africa has nothing to do with that. Bees were made illegal in Los Angeles in the 1800s because people thought that bees attacked fruit. <laughs> and perhaps this goes back to what is a bee and what is not a bee, right? Bees are not wasps, and maybe there are some wasps that can eat like rotten fruit, and people just called everything a bee, right? In 1917, there was an article in the LA Times that said, we need to repeal this outdated and ancient law. And a hundred years later, we're still talking about this. And we're not even in LA right now and we're talking about this. So the policymakers are doing a really fantastic job and this could be made legal as soon as this spring. So fingers crossed and you know, shoot letters of support down there if you so choose. The data slide here, and this is our transition slide into the future with bees, okay? Where's this all going? What does it mean? Is this all depressing, or is there something we can do? Here's what we can do, okay? This data slide shows research that was published in 2013 from Jeff Pettis and colleagues. They sampled pollen from these honeybee hives that were rented off of flatbed trucks to go into monoculture farmlands. So on the x-axis, on the horizontal, we've got a different crop type. So it starts with almonds on the left and apples. And on the y-axis, it's the proportion of pollen that matched up with that crop. So let me step you through here. The first bar with almonds, it has a very tall bar because almost 100% of the pollen found in those honeybee hives was almond pollen. So that's a good pollinator match, right? We know honeybees and almonds are in love so to speak. The next one is apples. There's also a relatively good match for apples, so it makes sense for an apple grower to perhaps rent a honey beehive if there are no other plants or flowers for the bees to forage upon when those apple blooms fall off. Here's the problem. Do you see any other bars there? The other crops that have a huge mismatch with pollen 
meaning the honeybees are not going to those crops, include blueberries, cranberries, cucumber, watermelon, pumpkin, and so forth. These are the only ones that were included in the study. What this means is that we, it's not that we didn't get those fruits. We had plenty of pumpkins, watermelons, cucumbers, blueberries, cranberries, but it's this teacher's pet effect where we think of a bee and the honeybees get all the credit. It's the other bees and the other pollinators that were doing the work. Think about a room with 20,000 students and you have the one in front, oh, thanks for doing all the work, you're doing great, and everybody else is like, we just did it all. We need to acknowledge the other pollinators because this is how to fix the economy and our current agricultural system. If we find ways to work with these growers to let them know, hey, if you're growing blueberries, cranberries, all of these crops, think about not renting honeybee hives off of the trucks. Think about how to promote the pollinators that are better matched with your crops. Often blueberry, uh, often bumblebees are good pollinators. You can set out a little shoebox even, and then you let them move in naturally to help their populations. That's going to give these growers a better yield because they're getting more of the pollinators that match the crop. It's going to help them save money because they're not paying a migratory beekeeper to get the bees from the truck. It's going to get those bees off of the trucks because those bees are getting very, very sick. It's going to help a lot of things, but it's controversial because these growers are often multi-generational families that have been working with migratory beekeepers that have been doing this for many generations as well. It's hard to educate them to say, it's been a great relationship, but it's not working for the science behind it, and it's not working for the environment, and you can make a better profit, and you can have a better yield if only you can understand and acknowledge these facts. So I'm training everybody here tonight as an ambassador of this cause. For the migratory beekeeper, if that beekeeper could then just keep his or her bees in a wonderful field with a diversity of flowers, their honey production and the health of the bees would also be improved. So it's really a win, 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 win across the board. If only somebody would listen, right? That's what you're doing tonight. Here's the crazy part of the talk and into our future with bees. I want to take a note now from what you know about swarming, okay? And thinking about how we can actually incorporate bees into our future living environment. Bees are cavity-dwelling creatures for the most part. Sometimes you'll hear stories of, oh, this, this woman found uh, 50,000 bees in her walls. Like, crazy story, right? Because bees like to live in cavities, maybe we can let them. What if we designed homes in the future to allow bees to live in the walls? This is really weird, I know. But what if you acknowledge the fact that honeybees can keep their hives 90 degrees throughout the winter? Even if it's minus 20 degrees outside, Canada, Canada and Russia have amazing beekeeping industries because the bees can warm themselves. They do this by cuddling. So they'll huddle together, and they contract their wing muscles for heat, and they eat honey for fuel, and that's what they do. What if we use that for insulation? How much money do we spend on insulating our homes? We could do this for free. What if we piped water through the walls that have beehives in them, and then moved that warm water throughout the home, right? It's our future with bees, perhaps. What if even beyond our walls, we designed furniture? Right, getting back to the artists. <laughs> Living furniture. I actually have something like this in my, th I live in a third floor apartment in, in Dorchester in Boston, which is a tough area. We have room only for two chairs and a beehive. That's a table. It's our cocktail table. <laughs> and these honeybees come and go, you know, they'll actually just go pollinate the gardens and come back. And it's very relaxing to watch. So this is a very calming thing. If you have the opportunity to go to a meeting of the New York City Beekeepers Association, which is a thing. I was there last Monday giving a talk. It's a bunch of stressed out lawyers. <laughs> not, not to generalize, but it is. And they're so stressed and they get bees and things like this because it helps calm them. And we're going to need things like that in the future. Now, in terms of the other species of bees, the 19,999 or so, if we think about how to help them, it's more so about 
creating habitat. We don't even understand what many of these species are or what they do. We have amazing different colored bees like iridescent green sweat bees and you have leaf cutter bees and orchid bees that can actually trim off flower petals and glue them together into a sort of nest home. You can also create bee hotels. So this could be a fun family activity or date night if you're collecting wine corks and you want to put them in a flower pot. You can put it on its side and you let some of these other lesser understood species of bees to just mine. They can bore into wood or bore into cork and they create a little habitat in there. You can even put um, like there's some bricks with holes or pine cones and debris. You repurpose trash. You can think about the artistry behind it, knowing how the bee sees the world. And like this, this is an image of the St. Ermin's Hotel in London. On the rooftop, they've used this purple color, knowing that bees see purple and blue much more so. Hummingbirds, as a side note, see red. So if you wanted to do something with hummingbirds and the art and the biology behind that, you might want to do some reds there too. But this is a very much a set it and forget it type thing. You can put bamboo or even PVC piping for the mason bees. So these are the native bees. And chapter seven of the book that has to do with our future with bees looks at diversity of bee species on rooftop farms and rooftop levels and ground levels and they're comparable. So the diversity of bee species is relatively equal on the roof as it is on the ground. Even though this article today, looking at England, said there are more bee species in the cities than in the country. So subtle differences there. In Asia, in Bhutan, here's an image of this amazing temple where they have a beehive that nests on the outside. And people say, OK, no big deal. We're just going to let it live there. Right? It's OK. But in America, things are a little bit different. In the future here in America, I think these things will become to merge. They're going to come together, and we're going to look at houses that might have an exterior bee habitat and allow for some type of an interior for people. We'll have furniture that's alive, furniture that incorporates pollinators. This is just an outdoor table made out of repurposed wood pallets. And a really futuristic house could look something like this that has actual hexagonal shapes that let light in. And we're really taking a page from other social organisms. The last part of the talk is really the craziest part. So buckle up here. We're going full speed. We're driving it home, OK? We're going to take a page now from psychology and uh, Pavlovian conditioning. If you're familiar with Pavlov and his dog experiments, where he associates a bell with a food reward, and he actually can train that dog to associate that sound of a bell with food. He'll start to salivate. And so people are doing this with bees. We're doing this in a way that doesn't have to do with salivating, but perhaps with that tongue extension like this. Chapter one of the book looks at how bees are often separated into short, medium, and long-tongued species. So here's a longer-tongued bee. And what you can do is associate a food source like sugar water with a smell so that the bee eventually smells something when her tongue is in. And she'll say, oh, that smell is food. And then she'll stick her tongue out. And when the bee sticks her tongue out, we know that there's some association there. Here's how it's done. On the left, you have a restrained bee. I know it's kind of weird. <laughs> and you're teaching that bee here to associate a food reward with an odor, so that eventually, when the food reward is gone, the bee sticks her tongue out with the odor. OK? Now you're all experts at how to train a bee. Why would we do this? OK? Well, if you wanted to train a bee, you could put a little radar tracking device on her, like on the left-hand side, and then send her out. She'll go to wherever you're telling her to go to. We talked about this a little bit with the almond crops, right? Honeybees are the only bees that really are naturally associated with almond crops. The USDA has started studies for the blue orchard bee to pollinate almonds by training them. They have to tell the bees, hey, go to the almonds. There's food there. And then they do it. This actually shows here, if you train a bee three times, that she's going to remember that association for about 72 hours rather than just training her once. So it's amazing how they learn. It's like for myself, you have to teach me something like three times. I'll remember it. If you teach me something once, I won't remember it so well. Bees are very amazing. Here's some almond blossoms and an example of teaching that association. This you get. What if we were to change that odor to something a bit more strange, like a bomb? So bomb-sniffing bees, 
It's a thing, it is, and there's a purpose to it because thinking about our future with bees and even this crazy world in which we live, we need better tools and we need sustainability with all of this. So if we were to train a bee for sniffing out bombs and then send her out into let's say a landmine field with that radar tracking device, and let's say we had 100 bees doing this, so we had some degree of accuracy, and you had 90 bees of the 100 that go to one part of a landmine field. One might assume, okay, there's a landmine there, let's go clear it, right? It's a weird benefit to bomb sniffing bees. What do we do now to clear landmine fields? Let's maybe send out you know, something that might get blown up, right? So 90% accuracy, it's pretty good. Now, what if you don't send the bee out, but you have them stay in? And this is a crazy image that looks like bees at desks, almost, <laughs> right? It's this kind of device where it's a handheld device. You install these trained bees into these desks that can record when their tongues are sticking out. And it's something that's actually already being used in airports in Ireland, where you can look at bags, luggage, right? Like, can you imagine a day where we don't have to take our shoes off anymore <laughs> at the airport? I mean, some lines are doing that, but even with bees here too, bomb sniffing bees. And this is amazing because the bees, even though it looks very futuristic here, they can just go home after their eight hour shift, <laughs> right? It's sustainable. It's weird, but it's sustainable. So in closing, I want you to think about some other applications. There's a new group that's looking at slums in Mumbai, India, for how to bring this technology this bee technology, to look at people who have diabetes issues that can blow into this device, and bees can actually detect glucose levels from the breath. So for people who don't have access to healthcare, whether it be there are no uh, physicians nearby or they don't have the funds to do anything with, they can actually get some help before an actual medical issue comes. Even in the developed world, people are looking at how to detect cancer from the breath using bees. So our future with bees is also bright. It's just a little bit different, and I hope it brought some wonder to your evening. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Noah. Thanks very much. Noah arrived in San Francisco on Friday, and on Sunday, I believe, contracted a bad case of food poisoning. So he's been suffering, but he's here tonight like a trooper. Yes. And as the, is the tradition with Wonderfest events, we welcome some questions. Rather than pass a microphone around, I'm going to ask you to fight your way up to the floor microphone right here. And perhaps those of you who are near the mic or in the way of the mic might make a path. We have two beekeepers in the audience. I'd like to, to urge Meredith and Jake right here, beekeepers, to uh, maybe there are others. But um, please, we have a question already. But Jake, you promised to come up with a tough one, right? Yeah. All right. I have a question that I think I know the answer to, but uh, can bees pollinate GMO food, uh, plants? <laughs> mm. Can bees pollinate GMO crops? So sure, yeah. So often genetically modified organisms, GMOs, um, have a particular aspect of their genomes that's changed so that they can, let's say, resist drought or uh, frost, but they still require pollination nonetheless. Um, so the answer would be yes, they can, yeah. How can local beekeepers help you? How can local beekeepers help me? May I ask you to, to define you? Do you mean me? Yeah. Specifically, like locally in the area, do you need more? Oh. Do you need more beekeepers to help you? Like, can you enlist them to help you? If they want to put your hives in a, if they have them in a bad area, could you have like have an area and then we would move our hives to that area so it would help in that area. Mm. So it would be like helping us out and helping you out at the same time. Absolutely. So so how can local beekeepers help? in essence. So, uh, well, there are a couple ideas there. As I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, everything we do at the Best Bees Company is to generate funding for research. 
and that research is all to be published. So we're always doing research, collecting data, looking at any types of trends. So as a local beekeeper yourself with many thoughts, whatever ideas you might have or observations you have, questions, kick them over to us and then we can figure out how to do an experiment with it. For those of you who are beekeepers, you know it's such a, uh, a long-standing tradition of beekeeping that there's a saying goes, if you ask 10 beekeepers a question, you get 11 different answers. And everybody has a different perspective and I see the value in all of them, but I also see the need to put them to research. We need to get some data to see which claims work and which ones don't. And there's a lot of value to that and it's specific to each region. So local beekeepers figuring out best practices, things that work well for you, let's try to work together to get some data behind it. One study we're doing this year is looking at all these different cities and the height elevation at which bees are thriving and seeing if there's a point beyond which they don't thrive anymore. Um, we just don't know. And we've got a huge interest in New York City and Chicago and even Seattle, the tallest building west of the Mississippi, Columbia Center, is getting beehives this year. So it's, it's uh, something we need to just keep collecting data on and that's where we can work together. Yeah. I have one request and then a question. Uh, can you put a link to legislators in LA that we can email for encouraging the laws to be changed? Mm -hmm. And on like the Facebook page, and then the second um, question would be about creating habitat for other kinds of bees. So the shoebox for mm -hmm. bumblebees and the corks, like is there anything else that we, you know, I, I would like to incorporate that into the garden. Great, thank you. Um, Katie Peterson is a city councilor in LA. Now I'll duck, because she's gonna get a lot of messages. <laughs> but she's, she's an ally, so I think the tone of messages to any LA city councilor should really be a positive one. When I was there last June um, for the talk, I did some investigative journalism, and I went to some restaurants that I had heard have beehives, and I was escorted off the property, because they said, you can't come around here asking these questions. Yes, we have bees, yes, we use fresh local honey, but no, we can't tell anybody about it. So it was really interesting, and I think it will happen. It's just a matter of time. Uh, so I'll put a link uh, with Katie Peterson's info. Um, and then in terms of creating habitat, we're partnering up with the Design Museum Boston, which is a new museum. There's also Design Museum Portland to work out a citizen scientist program. So we can all get together, we'll bring our trash, and we'll bring some paint, and we'll work at ways to creatively arrange this in a way that's kind of that set it and forget it um, type of habitat, there's almost no wrong way to do it other than just chemical free things, but you just put it out there. The thing that inspired me to get into beekeeping and into bees is, as a kid, this backyard biology, like the wonder of going into the backyard, thinking, what is back here? And that has never left me. All of these different species I'm still discovering, and so there's so much more to learn, and just by putting this general habitat there of whatever trash you might have, uh, you know, you keep an eye on it. You certainly don't want to get any like big pests there, but things that have small holes or uh, things that allow bees to drill into them um, are very good opportunities. And we can follow up with some more specific design notes, too. Yeah, thanks. I know. Thanks for the presentation, first of all. Uh, first, a question. Are you familiar with Dr. Frankie's work at UC Berkeley? Dr. Frankie, uh, yeah. limited. Okay. Which specific work? Well, he has his Irving V Lab, yeah. and he has uh, information and actually workshops on enhancing native bee populations in California. That's great. So if this crowd doesn't know about that, it's something else they can go to for native bee populations. Yeah, that's fantastic. My PhD advisor, uh, Phil Starks, was a postdoc at Berkeley, so okay. kind of got an academic lineage there. Maybe I'll use that to get an in for a research partnership. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Sure, so question about Varroa mites. And again, this is uh, really when the floodgates opened. In 1987, this new pest, this parasite, came into the United States. It's originally from Southeast Asia. And with it brought many other infections, bacterial and fungal infections. It's almost like a mosquito. It can transmit other things. It's a vector. And that's the year when the game changed. Many beekeepers gave up because this new mite was just killing off so many beehives. What we do at my lab is we're always testing and monitoring 
for Varroa level. So on all of the beehives that we manage, we then do Varroa counts. We do the same thing for what's called Nosema, which is a fungal infection that is a current huge plague in the United States. Um, that's kind of what's killing our bees today, Nosema. So what are we using to treat for Varroa? And we are doing all organic practices. Powdered sugar is one method, which is something for beekeepers. You actually sprinkle powdered sugar on the bees, and it makes them groom themselves, makes them feel dirty. They have to clean. And that helps them pick off the Varroa mites. We actually don't do that too much, because we're looking at a much longer term solution. So getting to the theme of our future with bees, we've been working with Marla Spivak, who is a MacArthur genius fellow. She's at the University of Minnesota, and she uh, won this MacArthur Award due to her um, breeding of what are called hygienic queens. These are genetic lines of honeybees that are naturally able to groom off varroa mites and also get other um, debris out of the hive. So we're trying to work with those stronger genetic lines as a longer term solution. Yeah. So I was really interested to hear about all the bees living on flatbed trucks. And I was wondering, um, are, is there any correlation between the die-offs of colonies and numbers of bees living on flatbed trucks? And I just think about you know, trucks and diesel stops, and they sit there for an hour, and the, the truck's running the whole time, and diesel fumes. I'm just wondering if bees like living on diesel trucks. Yeah. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's a huge problem. There's some uh, movies, there's one called Vanishing of the Bees. Maybe some of you have seen this. Um, they interview a lot of migratory beekeepers and they're very hard hit. It really hurts the business and it's driven the cost of renting their bees up. In the past five years, the cost of almonds has doubled. Um, I'm not saying it's entirely due to the expensive price of bees, and certainly the drought plays a role, but, um, but that's a problem affecting the economics behind everything. Um, my other thought has just escaped me. Diesel, yes. So uh, many people also think with urban beekeeping that it's polluted in the city, so bees won't like it. And that's something that would affect humans perhaps more so than bees because there's the added benefits of the diverse gardens, perhaps less pesticides, closer together. Um, so. We don't exactly know the mechanisms behind the action here. Same thing with neonicotinoid pesticides and other things that are killing bees. We don't have enough research yet into finding out the exact mechanisms of action, and that's what's needed. One of the chapters of my dissertation showed that older bees are the ones that are the healthiest. Those are the foragers. The older bees go out to the flowers, and they're left behind if hives are moved during the day. And they're not supposed to be moved during the day. But often we see these images all the time of hives being transported. Bees could inevitably be left behind. If that happens, the hives are immunocompromised because all of the healthy bees are now gone. And perhaps that's a mechanistic link between why we see more disease in hives that are on flatbed trucks. Yeah. Um, you partially answered my question. It was going to be about the role of uh, the neonic pesticides. Um, what is the status right now of research on that, on sort of understanding that role in the dying off of the bees? Sure. So, um, so neonicotinoid pesticides are a new type of pesticide. Alex Liu is a researcher at the Harvard School of Public Health who um, has published at least two different papers now showing a mechanistic link, showing that, well, not necessarily, but showing that uh, beehives that he fed this pesticide to um, died. So the criticisms there are that the dose was too high and that he didn't look at underlying infection levels to see if they were healthy bees or sick bees. Um, so it's been a bit controversial. And he's also very uh, vocal about his data. And I always say, whenever Alex and I have done talks together, I always say, like, let the data speak for themselves. You know, like, let's just put it out there and see what people say. Um, Jeff Pettis and colleagues, so the same researcher who did the crop, um, the pollen figure with the yellow bars. He recently published a paper with his colleagues showing that although neonicotinoid pesticides can hurt bees, at realistic levels, it's only one part of the problem. It's not the everything to it. It's a contributing factor. So Jeff Pettis, you can check out his research. 
One more question about the bee die-off. Just how serious is that? Is it worldwide? If nothing were done, would all bees be dead 20 years from now? Well, what, what's the situation? Mm. So, um, so it is a big problem. It is worldwide. Uh, for mostly developed countries, Jeff, uh, sorry, uh, Alex Liu linked up this 2006 start of colony collapse disorder with that being the year that Monsanto and Bayer uh, released uh, their new corn coated seed, um, seed coats with neonicotinoids. That meant that the corn syrup or any corn product had the pesticide in it and many migratory beekeepers at the time says Alex Liu were um, the beekeepers would take all of the honey and then they would feed the bees high fructose corn syrup and they didn't realize that this was in fact a pesticide now because the neonics are a systemic pesticide it's in all of the plant it's not just a sprayed applicant um, and we don't know what the time frame is at this time for a bee die off but we do need to acknowledge the other 20,000 species of bees we don't know how they're affected and we need to start studying them a lot more yeah Yes, yes. So, um, so it kind of relates to some health benefits of bee products. It's one of the papers that my lab is working on. Apitherapy is the term for this concept. Um, bees produce at least five products. Um, so you have honey, pollen, wax, uh, propolis, which is like a bee glue. It's bee medicine. And... Um, uh, Royal jelly, thank you. Um, venom is also used too. That's not necessarily a bee product, but in terms of the pollen and the allergy effect, so if you consume local pollen, the idea is that your body is used to that exposure year round. If you have a spoonful of local honey, there are bits of pollen in that. So by springtime or whatever time the big blooms come out, your body isn't shocked and say, oh, what is this pollen? And then it attacks everything, including yourself. You've already been exposed to that. So that's the idea behind local pollen benefiting allergy sufferers, although the data supporting that remain elusive. We need more research to understand it. Yeah. Uh, over here. That's so interesting. So the, mm. so the question is about bees producing a different frequency to get flowers to produce more pollen. Uh, and I am not intimately familiar with this research. It sounds very fascinating. I do know that one of our clients who just bought 100 beehives um, did so because they're interested in getting maple trees to produce more sap. And there's a researcher at Cornell with whom they spoke who said that having bees can tickle the flowers to increase their nectar production. And so they signed up. And I was like, wow, I didn't even know about that. But it could be true. I, I'm just not familiar with that research. And more needs to be done. Have yeah. I haven't checked out the frequency of buzzing, but I do know that there's a very eccentric woman in the Boston area named Nancy Mangione. She was a former music teacher. She's retired now. She says that bees uh, buzz in the key of A. <laughs> and mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm not familiar, but she has a YouTube video, and it is very trippy. Like, <laughs> it's incredible. Uh, Nancy Mangione, it's called, like, Bees in the Key of A. It's, uh, it's very weird and cool. So, uh, so check it out. I don't know the data behind it, though. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jocelyn Freeman has a book, uh, The Song of Increase, and mm. she talks about the kind of good songs that the bees sing, and also when they uh, expand their hive, like how they map it out by like, mm -hmm. moving on to each other, and how they sing different songs at those different times. So um, her book is called The Song of Increase, Jocelyn Freeman. So, 
great. The the song of in increase of increase. Jacqueline Freeman. Interesting book. Yeah. Yes. Sure. So the vaccines that we're working on, um, let's see, came out of uh, my research on how to figure out the immune function of bees. Um, thinking how to communicate this. So uh, with the evolution of the immune system, there was a bit of a split with uh, animals that have a backbone versus those that do not. Animals with backbones, like us, the vertebrates, we produce antibodies, so we have a very specific immune response. Um, so if we get infected with something, we're usually, we have a protection against that strain of pathogen for a long time. With invertebrates, like bees, they don't have a specific immune response at all. So the idea of vaccinating an invertebrate was almost unheard of in a way, because there's supposed to be no specificity to the response and no memory to it. What we have put forth is this idea that we can trigger a, it's not specific and not general, it's kind of a targeted immune function against all fungal infections, and that's what's really killing bees right now, we're finding, this nosema. So we're increasing the natural defenses against fungal infections. Not a specific strain or species of fungus, but all fungus in bees um, to get them to have we're, we're tricking them into thinking that there's a lot of fungus. We feed them a little uh, part of the cell wall of fungus called beta-glucans at a really high level, and it tricks the bees to, into thinking, oh my gosh, there's a ton of fungus, and then they upregulate their natural um, antimicrobial peptides to fungus. Um, and it works with, well in the laboratory. We've had a hard time translating it into the field, so that's what's been slowing us down. Yeah. Nosema is one of the vaccines, and then the other two, there's one for gram-positive bacteria, the other's for gram-negative bacteria, and those are just subtle differences in the cell wall composition. Yeah, yeah. Since we're recording this, we want you to speak in the microphone and hand, please. Uh, so, back to the powdered sugar thing, I use yarrow myself instead of powdered sugar, and it's a more natural thing instead of putting powdered sugar, uh, sugar into your beehive. And I was also wondering, since you were talking about natural uh, honeybees, or I mean native bee, uh, honeybees, which one is your favorite and why? Wow, my favorite bee. You know, carpenter bees are so interesting. Uh, so carpenter bees look like bumblebees, but they're big. They're maybe the biggest bees I've come across here. Australia has some really big bees. In the book, actually, chapter six, it's called the Bee Directory. And the book itself is like a, a coffee table book. Every time you turn the page, it's a different topic to keep it moving. Um, there's a great art direction team. And chapter six slowed the book down. It was on pause for a while because some of these very rare bees um, were hard to come by. And we worked with the Natural History Museum in London to get some really great images of bees that were on pins. Um, they looked dead. So we wanted to make them come alive a little bit. But it's funny because there's a little uh, shadow that says the actual size. And the biggest one that I've actually seen are these carpenter bees. They look like bumblebees. But if you're out in a garden and you watch the flowers, it's relaxing until this big, like, B-52 bomber of a bee. And then the flower it lands on just falls over. Um, and they're really funny. They also nest above ground. So they would be confused for bumblebees. Bumblebees nest underground. Carpenter bees are above ground, and they will bore into wood. They could cause structural damage after a decade or so, so they could be considered a pest in that sense. But they often like old sheds, um, so I like carpenter bees. Yeah. So here in uh, here in California, we're kind of in the midst of an historic drought. Uh, I was hoping you could talk for a little bit, uh, just kind of on the impact, whether it's large or great, on bee populations here in this state. Sure. So what's the impact of a drought on bee populations? Um, so I don't know of a data publication offhand um, about this, but what one could assume is that with a drought, we've got a really tough situation for non-agricultural lands. That means wildflowers, really, and, and weeds, right? Weed is such a dirty word in many senses of it. But with agricultural lands, the almond crops take up a ton of water. So in that sense, it's almost a haven when we're bringing those bees there, although it's quite unnatural. Um, and I'm not sure yet how honey production has been affected, but we could 
perhaps attribute changes in honey production over time to drought conditions, that would be a really interesting data set I would like to explore. Yeah. I have a habitat of carpenter bees. They have invaded a redwood trellis, and they've been living in that trellis for about 20 years. And I expect it's going to collapse at any moment because they've been carving into it for 20 years. Um, most of them are black. The vast majority of them are black. In the last two years, I've seen wheat-colored carpenter bees. What are they? Hmm. So uh, around the area, there are at least 300 native species of bees. And they're very uh, un study. They're, they're, there's so much more to know about them. So there are different species of bumblebees that are even different uh, color variations that could take over within the same species, or color variation could indicate a different species. So I don't exactly know what this different colored carpenter bee um, is, but one of the two options would be it's just you know a blonde instead of a brunette of the same type, and then the other option would be it's a different species with a similar behavior to it. If you ever wanted to control a carpenter bee population in a chemical free way, duct tape solves so many things, right? <laughs> it's amazing. So duct tape, if you wanted to put duct tape over the hole, you know, it would be killing them, but it would be a chemical free way to kill them. So I'm not saying do it, but if you have to do something, yeah. If there's anybody here who would like that trellis, I am moving and I am very concerned about what's going to happen to those bees because I can't imagine that the new owners are going to want the bees and they've been my friends for 20 years. Yeah. So fuchsia scarf, if you want, if you want four 20 foot four by fours that are filled with carpenter bees, <laughs> please come find me. <laughs> Thank you. One last question. Okay, you know, in an urban neighborhood like this, in a tenderloin, we um, sometimes I see a lot of bees. They're kind of going around flowers. Are those, are there wild bees that are forming colonies, or, or is that usually that someone is keeping bees? Usually they're kind of falling over and near death, and mm. you put a little sugar water, and they kind of drink it up and fly off. Mm. But is, yeah. uh, are there in inner cities, are there wild bee colonies? Absolutely. So in inner cities, are there wild bee colonies and beehives? There absolutely are. And again, it's almost like a haven for bees. This study that was out today um, in, from England showed that there are more bee species in at least four cities in England compared to the countryside. So the diversity of bees is greater. If you see a bee kind of taking a nap, as you were describing, often those are a type of bumblebee that just stop for the midday and they just I'm tired. Even the squash bees are amazing because they will match their daily behavior with the squash flower. The squash flower blooms early in the morning and then it will close at high noon and the squash bees will take a nap inside the flowers. And then in the afternoon the flowers open up and the bees continue on. So there's so much more to learn and so much more to discover there. It's a world of wonder. So, thank you. So I'll live each day with